I'm Matt Jacobs, director of the Bob Graham Center for Public Service here at the University of Florida. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Okora at Pew Hall, whether you are here physically or joining us remotely. I very much look forward to our, tonight's discussion of Pax Atlantica, NATO's Enduring Alliance with historian Timothy Sale. I want to thank the Center for European Studies for co-hosting and working so closely with us on this, and particularly Dr. Zachary Selden for suggesting tonight's speaker. I also want to note that the Center for European Studies is hosting a virtual roundtable discussion of the situation in the Ukraine tomorrow at noon. It will include experts from Baylor University, College of William and Mary, Georgia Southern, and the University of Manchester. I would also like to highlight a very valuable list of resources on the Ukrainian crisis that the Center for European Studies has posted on their website. You can access that just by going to ces.ufl.edu, and it's in the slider bar, and you can uh, go ahead and review that. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful material there. If you haven't already, uh, for those of you here in person, uh, please visit the sign-in table at the back. We have a brief survey for you to complete that will help us uh, continue to improve and, and develop uh, excellent programming going forward. Uh, so please do that. Uh, now let me introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Sale is Assistant Professor of History and Director of the International Relations Program at the University of Toronto. He's the author of Enduring Alliance, A History of NATO and the Post-War Global Order, about which he will be speaking tonight. He has co-edited two volumes, the first with Jeffrey Engel, Hal Brands, and William Inboden, titled The Last Card, Inside George W. Bush's Decision to Surge in Iraq, and with Susan Colburn, The Nuclear North, Histories of Canada and the Atomic Age. His research on NATO, Canadian-American relations, and intelligence issues has been published in the Canadian Military History Journal, Cold War History, Intelligence and National Security, the International Journal, International History Review, the Historical Journal, International Politics, the Journal of Strategic Studies, and in several edited volumes as well. Professor Sale is a senior fellow of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History, no relation as far as I know, uh, an affiliate of the Center for the Study of the United States and an associate of the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University in Texas. Dr. Sale will speak for approximately 25 to 30 minutes, after which we will have an audience Q&A. For those of you here, present here in Pew Hall, we will have a microphone that will circulate. For those of you attending remotely, you can submit your questions via the little bubble on the lower right uh, of your screen. Those will come into my email, so I'll be reading those out off uh, an iPad here uh, so that we can get to those as well. I will note, I do reserve the right for those, co those questions coming in remotely. If we have a lot on a similar topic, I will condense them into one question so that we can get through as many questions as possible. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sale for tonight's uh, talk. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. I want to thank especially the Bob Graham Center and the Center for European Studies and everyone who uh, made this visit possible. It is a real pleasure to be here today, but I'm here with mixed feelings. When people ask me to speak about my research on NATO, it's because the world is in a dangerous place. And that's certainly the situation today. Um, I know you'll be having this event on the Russian invasion of Ukraine tomorrow. And I'm hoping to supplement that in a way um, by looking at the longer sweep of NATO's history. It's now almost 73 years of history. There's so much discussion today about what NATO should do, what NATO shouldn't do, what NATO became, what it should not have become, et cetera, that I think it's really crucial to understand its history in the longer sweep. I want to take the time today to lay out the reasoning of NATO leaders, and especially of American leaders, based on their records, their writings in the archives, as to why NATO lasted, has lasted, for so long. So first off, I want to say that NATO's existence has never been guaranteed. The idea that it would last so long would be remarkable to those who built this alliance. And throughout the Cold War, presidents and prime ministers constantly reappraised NATO, asking, should we still keep it? Do we really need it? And every president, every prime minister and their cabinet that asked this question came to the same conclusion, 
that the alliance must be preserved to maintain what NATO's first Secretary General, Lord Ismay, called a Pax Atlantica. Leaders maintain NATO for so long and maintain it today not because it's an alliance of shared values. Those things, that, and I will speak about them, these shared connections between the states are important, but they don't explain why NATO endured. And fundamentally, leaders, American presidents, have maintained the military alliance because of what they believed it prevented. And they believed that it prevented the return of great power war in Europe. They believe it present, prevented a third world war. So I'm going to touch on three different episodes today. The origins of the alliance, the challenges of maintaining this alliance for so long, and the question of continuing the alliance, even expanding the alliance after the end of the Cold War. And I'm going to bring this story up to the end of the Cold War, but there are real connections to that history and today, and I hope that we can discuss those in the Q&A as well. The real riddle for understanding why NATO lasted so long is to ask why allied leaders thought war might come again to Europe and how they thought they prevented it. How did they think that NATO worked? And my answer here lies in their understanding of history. Because when the men who built the alliance, and at the time they, they were all men, almost exclusively men, they looked to their past. And the history of these men was war. Okay, some of these examples will be all too familiar to you. Here we have uh, General Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Bernard Montgomery. Here they are observing training ahead of the D-Day invasion of Normandy in 1944. A decade later, in the 1950s, these men would go on to be NATO's first Supreme Allied Commander Europe and the first Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. There are other wars, too, that matter here. If we think about the British prime ministers who supported war, we can think about Harold Macmillan on the left, Anthony Eden on the right, both men who joined guards regiments in the First World War, fought in the trenches, and who brought their memory of war into their statesmanship, their premierships, when they dealt with presidents. So uh, Eden on the top with Eisenhower, Macmillan with Kennedy. As these men are making policy, they're thinking about war. And it's not just the allied victors of the Second World War who make up this alliance. On the night of June 5th, 6th, 1944, the night of the D-Day invasion, uh, with, with Rommel away, it's a man named Spiedel who is in control of the German defenses at Normandy. And one of the Americans who jumps into Normandy with the vanguard paratroopers that night is a man named General Maxwell Taylor. Fast forward. In the 1960s, Taylor is a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Spiedel, standing at the top there with uh, the American Supreme Allied Commander, is the commander of NATO forces in Central Europe. And I could go on and on about the connections between these men, the connections between their wars and their service to NATO in the Cold War. The point is, when they sat around the council table to discuss the threat of war, they did so with real scar tissue under their suits. And given their experience, they did not think, and they had no good reason to think, that peace was the natural order of things. I'm not suggesting that these men all believed that the Soviet Red Army was standing just about ready to invade the Soviet, or to invade Europe. They actually did not believe that was the main threat to peace. It's a more complicated story, and it's a story about how these men, as presidents and as prime ministers, worried about how people, voters, but especially just people, would react in case another war seemed imminent. To understand their fears, we have to go back to Europe at the end of the 1945. Uh, and this is a picture of, of Dresden. Um, we need to go back to the rubble of Europe. And we've seen these pictures before. One American diplomat who was in Europe at the end of the war warned 
people who looked at these pictures that you could not smell the sickening sweet odor of burned flesh that permeated the post-war cities of the dead. Europe is fundamentally ruined. Whole cities ruined by this war. And there are real questions about where the people of Europe will look for security, what they will do to avoid another war. And this is worrying for the leaders in the 1940s. And I want to give some examples here. This is the British Foreign Secretary, Ernst Bevin, and three different crises, Finland, Norway, and Czechoslovakia, all explain just what it is these men worried about. The Finnish example is right at the end of the Second World War, um, when the Soviets make the Finnish leaders an offer they can't refuse. They tell the Finnish leaders that Moscow will dis direct Finnish foreign and defense policy, that the Soviet Union will take some Finnish territory, but they will allow Finland to survive as an independent country. The Finnish leaders have been through a horrible war. They don't believe that the Finns will fight again. They concede to these Soviet demands. And in 1947, the Soviet Union is preparing to make similar demands against the government of Norway. Norway is the middle picture. It's also had a brutal war. And the Norwegian leaders are worried that their people will ask them to give in to any Soviet requests for fear of another war. They would rather, the Norwegian leaders expect their people would rather give in than fight. And the Norwegians now, it's a critical moment in 1947, and we don't usually think about the Norwegians as playing such an important role in the origins of the Cold War. They reach out to London, to Ottawa, to Washington, and it sparks this idea, both in Washington and London, of these states working together so they don't have to face Soviet demands alone. Sort of the example that's the, the proof of the pudding is in 1948, there's a coup in Prague when Czech communists are going to take over Czechoslovakia. And while the Soviet Union doesn't invade, the, um, the coup plotters feel emboldened because the Soviet Union has forces nearby. So the Soviet policy in the early Cold War is not to invade other countries, but to mass force and then make requests. This was so worrying to Bevin, to Secretary Marshall, to President Truman, because they're worried that the Soviet Union would be able to just carve away at Europe slice by slice. They called it salami tactics later in the war. And the worry was that if the Soviet Union took too much of Europe, sliced off too much of the salami, the Americans and the British would at some point have to push back, and that would mean war. Their reasoning here is watching the Soviets and how they act, but also thinking back to and directly remembering and speaking about Hitler's demands in the 1930s before the Second World War, and also um, the miscalculations that had led to the First World War. They're thinking about the First and Second World War when they're making the policy for the Cold War. So it's these crises that really lead to the creation of NATO. The treaty is signed in 1949. And the goal of the politicians and diplomats, and here they are in the 1950s sitting around the table, was to make sure that no one ally would have to stand against Moscow alone, that no government would be approached with, with one of these offers they could not refuse from Moscow. They could refuse because they were part of an alliance that would protect them, and the integrated military command and all the war planning that followed was all an effort to give some tangible meaning to this idea of solidarity. This is not an alliance of democracies. Not to say that many of the allies are not democratic, but that's not why NATO was built. Instead, it was a sort of democracy insurance policy that would prevent a nervous and frightened public from feeling isolated and pressuring their government to give up their national interests to the demands of others. A fundamental belief that the people who had experienced the Second World War would not be willing to fight a Third World War if the Soviets rattled their saber. And so NATO's built, as I say, it's Treaty 1949, 
an integrated military command begun in the 19, early 1950s. And all of a sudden, the man who had posed these challenges to Europe, um, Joseph Stalin, died. And the Soviet Union begins to change its tune. They undertake something they called a peace offensive, or the Soviet smile, to try and thaw tensions. They avoid some of their aggressive efforts. And the NATO leaders then are posed with this extraordinarily difficult question. Has NATO put itself out of business? That's the question. Or is NATO working? The government leaders look at the situation in the 50s and they decide that this is a case of NATO working, that the Soviet Union has changed its tune because these old tactics won't work. Unfortunately, there are some, and I think we can understand this, who continue to ask, is NATO necessary? Do we need to spend all of this money? Um, and there are some people who just stopped caring about geopolitics in the 1950s. But the, the irony or the paradox I'm trying to get at here is that NATO's success, according to the Allied leaders at the time, was also NATO's greatest enemy. Right? By creating peace in Europe, which is what they thought it was doing, it seemed to take away the need for NATO at all. Right? It's actually dangerous in a way for NATO to succeed. And this question of whether NATO had put itself out of business is going to haunt NATO from the 1950s until very, very recently. So that's the origins of the treaty, why NATO is created, why the Integrated Military Command is created. But there are many decades left of the Cold War, and there are real challenges to maintaining the alliance. And I want to think about those. I want to focus here in particular on the anti-war and anti-nuclear protests of the 1970s and 1980s. These are British women changing, chaining themselves to an air base in the UK, and then uh, German uh, citizens protesting at a U.S. airbase in Germany. So much of the history of the end of the Cold War has focused on the Soviet collapse. But I think if you look at the records, you'll see that it's, it was no sure thing that NATO survived the Cold War or that it would outlaw, outlast the Warsaw Pact. And in fact, there was real fear, especially by the 80s, that NATO might collapse first. And the reason for this, again, lay within NATO states, not with anything the Soviet Union was doing in particular. For the entire Cold War, NATO's defenses rested on nuclear weapons. This was crucial to the strategy and the policy and the planning of NATO's defense plans. But by the 70s, and especially the 80s, more and more NATO citizens, especially in Europe, were protesting against NATO nuclear weapons. They weren't protesting against NATO per se as becoming extremely uncomfortable with the idea of these nuclear weapons. And it has real effects. These protesters have real effects on policy. And without getting into the nitty gritty of nuclear policy in the 70s and 80s, there are a few things I want to, I want to lay out here. In the 1970s, in the Carter administration, there's a plan to modernize NATO nuclear weapons in Europe. And one of the solutions is something that was famously called the neutron bomb. This was going to be the new style of weapon that NATO would use and arm itself with in Europe. And protests were so strong against the neutron bomb that NATO actually just doesn't deploy this weapon. They just don't modernize that class of weapon. In the early 80s, it's time to upgrade another nuclear weapon, the intermediate range nuclear forces. And there's major protests against this too, although NATO does deploy these weapons and then trades them away in a treaty in 1987. And then the third example here is in 1988 and 1989, NATO needs to modernize its short-range nuclear forces. So these are weapons that just fire nuclear weapons extremely short distances, um, sort of battlefield weapons. The problem is most of these are in Germany. Most of these would land in Germany. And the argument in Germany was the shorter the range, the deader the German essentially. These are weapons that will destroy Germany, and there's major protests against these weapons, and the German government asks NATO not to modernize them, not to modernize the short-range nuclear forces. So I gave I have three examples there. Only one of these modernization programs actually happened. I mean, if we think about this in baseball terms, uh, if you're batting 333, you're going to make a lot of money. If you're uh, 
alliance that rests on nuclear weapons, then you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. You need to hit for a higher average. So there's this other paradox happening in NATO in the 70s and 80s where leaders think these nuclear weapons are essential. They think they must be in Europe so that if a crisis comes, the people of Europe can know that they're protected. But in a period of peace, a period short of crisis, these are extreme political liabilities for leaders. They're people who want these weapons out of Europe. And there's a real fear in the alliance that the German government is going to ask the United States to withdraw its nuclear weapons from Germany. If the United States did that, there was an expectation that Congress would not allow United States troops to be stationed in Germany if they weren't defended with the most modern weapons. The US troops would come home, and this would create a cascade effect that would destroy NATO. So there's so much worry about sort of German public opinion in the 1980s that Brent Scowcroft, who's George H.W. Bush's national security advisor, will write him a memo in August of 1989. Okay, so August of 1989, just a few months before the fall of the Berlin Wall, Scowcroft says, managing our relations with Germany is likely to be the most serious geopolitical challenge our country faces over the next decade, unless we have to cope with the disintegrating Soviet Union. Now, of course, the USSR did disintegrate, right? The wall in Berlin will fall in November of 1989, after the wall falls, the Warsaw Pact will collapse, and ultimately the Soviet Union will collapse. But while these events are happening, National Security Council staffers in Washington have never forgotten that Russia still maintains real, conventional, and especially nuclear military power. And they're thinking about this power, and they're thinking about it not in Cold War terms. They're thinking about this in the same broad terms of history, the history of war that NATO's founders had been thinking about at the beginning of the Cold War. So while NATO is founded very much as part of the Cold War, its logic rests on ideas leaders have about, about war about the fact that war is a real possibility. It's not just a product of the Cold War. The tensions will outlive the Cold War. And so as American officials are thinking about the post-Cold War world, they identify, and I've grouped them here, as three main reasons why they think NATO must survive the end of the Cold War. The first is Germany. Just like Scowcroft said, this is the major geopolitical challenge for the US. It was the German problem, and that's what George Bush told Margaret Thatcher, the German problem that made NATO fundamental, indeed more important than ever. This is after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, that German, or NATO is more important than ever because it solves the German problem. So NATO could solve this problem. All of the rearmament of Germany in the post-Second World World, all of the limits on German power, were all established in a NATO context. And Western European allies, Americans, and Germans themselves, German leaders themselves, wanted to keep these limits on Germany. And that was even more important because Germany was about to be unified. Right? It was no longer just West Germany, but now it would be a unified Germany. And so President Bush uh, makes, uh, strikes a quid pro quo with Chancellor Kohl at Camp David the United States will support German unification, reunification, but that expanded Germany must be a part of NATO. That was the deal. And by maintaining NATO as, the, as a home for a unified Germany, NATO expanded eastward right at that moment with the unification of Germany. So maintaining NATO and the expansion of NATO come to be coupled right away. The other fear, the next problem on the list after Germany is something the staffers called instability. Okay. And what they worried about in those heady days as the Cold War was ending was that Europe would become unstable on a scale not seen since the aftermath of World War II, they said. 
So what is it they were worried about? They were, had some real worries. I'm going to put up a, a map of um, Europe today just so I can relate to some of the countries that I'm about to discuss. You can see, if I can do this, that there is a strip of land, of course, of uh, what are now NATO allies, but what included Warsaw Pact states. So I just would like to use this map, um, not with reference to the alliances yet, but just so we're clear on the area we're talking about. They're worried about this strip of land in 1990 and 1991. They're worried that it will, just as it had before the Cold War, be a site of competition and of tension. They actually know their history. They say they're worried that this strip of land, again, between Germany and uh, the Soviet Union then, or what would soon be Russia, would fall back into the cyclical pattern of Russo-German conflict and condominium that bedeviled Europe from 1870 to 1945. Those are the words from National Security Council memoranda at the time. They're worried that Eastern Europe will be a site of security competition. Where will these states look for their defenses? Will they try and recreate that rickety system of alliances that had existed in the first half of the 20th century? Will some NATO ally like France make a guarantee to Poland that will create problems for the alliance? It's understood that NATO can provide the solution to this problem too. It's understood in 1990 and 1991 that there's a possibility these states could join NATO and reduce the likelihood of this area becoming this mushy no man's land, uh, temptations for others, and especially Germany and Russia. The Americans even say in, in private at this time that the United States must stand between Germany and Russia in Central Europe. This idea that this will be a site of competition and that it's important to remove it as a site of competition in Europe. And then the third, I will mention the third worry that the American officials had, why they thought NATO was, uh, must stay and indeed expand, was the growing European community, this uh, integrated, economic community in Europe. They expected that former Warsaw Pact states would want to join the European community, of course become the European Union later. And there was a worry that if those states, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia at the time, were to become incorporated into the European economy, the European allies would feel like they were de facto obligated to defend those states. And as a result, the Americans would have a de facto obligation to protect them as well. And so there was real thinking, understanding that as Europeans' economic integration expands, it will be important um, for the United States to have some say in that, that they have a real controlling role in who the United States is obligated to protect. They don't want it just to happen by chance. They want to be um, in control of it. So if the United Europe was to grow, NATO would have to keep pace. So I'll just try and bring this to a, an end here shortly, but my, what's so striking in these documents from the early 1990s is that it's not Cold War logic that drives the continuation of NATO and its expansion. Actually, Scowcroft says it best. The basic lesson of the two world wars was that American power is essential to any stable equilibrium on the continent. It's the lessons of the first half of the 20th century that are just as important as the second half. And Scowcroft says to President Bush, geopolitical realities will endure. And this is fine in a, in a seminar and a discussion of how international politics works, but it's a real political problem in the early 1990s because no one wants to hear in, after the end of the Cold War that geopolitical realities will endure. American officials knew that this was unpopular. This was the time of the peace dividend, of savings. The idea that Europe was still a potential site for war was not popular. And the idea that defense spending, that support for NATO could be um, kept up in the United States by arguing that war was a real possibility in Europe simply was not going to fly. 
And so US officials, NATO officials start to speak about the alliance in a different way. They say that the alliance has changed as a result of the end of the Cold War. One NSC staffer recommends advertising NATO publicly as an alliance of shared values. And this language was very popular at the time, but as another US official put it in a secret document at the time, that's all bunk. He says, despite the communique rhetoric, we know that NATO's continuing solidarity is not primarily a consequence of our common values. It's those things I mentioned before, mistrust between European states, the fear of Russian backsliding, the possible instability in these former bloodlands of Europe in between Germany and Russia. That's why they argue that NATO should continue. But there's a catch that comes with this public argument. If you argue that NATO is an alliance of shared values, the US officials understood that Eastern European states would then say, we share those values, can we not join the alliance? And of course they did. Hungary, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, and other states would ask for NATO membership. In, so in this new formula, of course, NATO as an alliance of values, it's expandable. It can grow. That just makes sense. If other people share these values, the alliance can grow. And indeed, wrote uh, someone in, in the White House in 1991, we would make the expansion of NATO a goal. Okay, so simply put, to survive, NATO had to expand. The process of expansion in, nine, in the 1990s is, is a messy one, it's contingent, but it rests on this fundamental assumption that NATO offered the best and easiest solution to the problems that might lead to general war. Okay, we'll give the last word to uh, General Montgomery here. Um, in writing, he said that the men of his generation who had fought in the war wanted peace above all. But as he put it, peace in the modern world cannot be assured without military power. That fact might be sad, but it is true. Peace was, in fact, a byproduct. Okay, I think I'll leave it there, and if people have questions, I'd love to discuss. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, so you want to sure. join me here? Uh, just as a reminder, for those of you attending remotely, uh, please feel free to use the little bubble in the bottom right corner of your screen to submit your questions uh, electronically, and I'll ask them uh, up here. Uh, we'll also have a mic circulating. Anna has it over here. I'm going to uh, take the uh, liberty of asking the first question, actually. Uh, so one of the things that I find interesting about your talk, but also interesting about the history of NATO more generally is, of course, as the Berlin Wall is crumbling and there's all this discussion about the instability of the land in between Germany and Soviet Union slash Russia, is that, of course, the places where NATO was actually deployed as a military force, you can use the bombing campaign in, in Kosovo and in, in former Yugoslavia, um, but otherwise it's Afghanistan after 9-11 and it's Libya. You know, those are the, the three main uh, episodes, if you will, of NATO military deployment, which of course only one of those is even remotely close to the area for which NATO was intended to provide right. stability. So this might be partly speculative because the documents aren't open on some of this stuff, uh, obviously, yet. But what's your take on why is it that those become the places where NATO can be used or is used, and whether or not it should be is another question, actually, too. But why is it that those become the areas where it actually is utilized in, the, in a military sense? Right, absolutely. So, yeah, there are two interesting issues and two sort of historical frames. NATO is going to take on uh, this out-of-area role even before Kosovo in 1999, when it actually intervenes in, in the middle of the decade in uh, the war in Bosnia and actually shoots, shoots down Serbian um, fighters and so on. It leads to real tensions with, um, with Russia already at that point in 1999. Um, even exacerbates that. So I, I, I think of those two together in one category as this peculiar moment and a really important moment, especially for thinking about today. One, it was clear in 1995 that the Europeans themselves were not able to act to end the violence in Bosnia, and the next available tool was NATO, 
And similarly, by 1999, we see this humanitarian catastrophe, um, this, of course, is in the same decade with Rwanda, Srebrenica, and so on. And we see, again, states reaching for NATO as um, the tool they have available. I do not think that those two operations fit within the broader argument for why NATO was created and why it persisted. Um, I think they reflect this period in the 1990s when allied leaders were thought it was really important to show that NATO could do something, um, and also for other reasons like the European inability to act, it was the, the tool available. And there was real debate in a lot of NATO allies whether the Kosovo bombing was, was appropriate without UN sanctions. So I lump those together as NATO um, stepping into a new role, one that NATO had really resisted during the Cold War. There were lots of calls for NATO to do stuff during the Cold War. And no, it could never be agreed because there were always other allies who said, no, that's not a good idea. That will create problems for us. It will create problems for the Cold War. I, and then the next point, um, Afghanistan and then Libya, I really do think that 9-11 changes the frame. It changes the frame spectacularly. And there's uh, a special pressure from the United States for NATO to show that it matters in the post 9-11 security uh, world. Um, it's important to note, I think, a bunch of NATO allies do join the United States in uh, Afghanistan um, before it becomes a NATO operation. Um, I do think that these incidents all make it much more difficult to make the case for NATO today. Though I do think they operate in a different realm than, than the alliance was created or maintained. Okay. Do we have a question? Uh, it, yeah. Hey, thanks very much for your uh, really interesting comments. Um, my name is Michael Gorham. I teach Russian studies here at University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Jacobs mentioned the, the, the incident in the, in the Balkans, and that's a uh, I've been listening to uh, Vladimir Putin a lot, and he likes to talk about history a lot. Um, his, uh, his vision of history is a bit skewed in many dimensions, but I wanted to kind of check in with you to, to, to see what your perspective is. Um, he refers to the Serbian incident as kind of an offense to, to, to Russia for not even uh, uh, calling the Russians to see, you know, to get their take on it. Was there any communication, uh, as far as you know, between NATO and Russia uh, during that entire event? The second question it has to do with the, uh, his, he loves to talk about the promise that was made uh, and, the, and the phrase that has almost become a meme in the pro-Putin media is not an inch to the east. And that was, I think, uh, Jim Baker, who was, uh, was he the, the, the Secretary of State under uh, President Bush. Uh, was that was that actually a, a promise that was made by Baker? Uh, looking at your map and listening to you talk about the, that strip, it sounds like if it was, it was never at all uh, in the intent of, sure. uh, of NATO to s stick with the, with the current borders. Great. And uh, the, the third thing is the um, the uh, there's often references to Putin in the early 2000s as himself reaching out about the possibility of Russia joining NATO. Was that ever seriously uh, proposed? And if so, from your perspective, do you think NATO would have contemplated that move? Great, thank you. Yeah, really wonderful set of questions that I think all connect with this idea of um, Putin's version of history and what role NATO plays in it. And so we do have um, these speeches and articles and so on that, that in which Putin lays out these offenses by uh, the West that involve actions, especially Kosovo, where NATO is, is bombing in Europe, not being a defensive alliance, um, that NATO is expanding east, um, and that that's both in violation of Russian interests, but more importantly for him, he would say a violation of, of this promise that was supposedly made um, by Baker in 1990. So, I, I don't think that Putin is a reliable historian, and um, that's maybe my bias, but uh, as a historian, I, I, don't, I don't think he's a reliable historian, and I don't think that um, his history really does match reality. And, and I'll give you some examples in a sec, but I do think it's, that's important and, and also frustrating for me because 
we could and should be having a really nuanced conversation about strategic interests and decisions made, but now they have fallen into this realm of, of rhetoric and history is being used by Putin. So um, on the promise, and I, I think this is really important to, to get out there, it, this is a discussion in 1990 between Secretary of State James Baker and Mikhail Gorbachev. It's a discussion about the future of Germany. It's about a discussion about the terms for the reunification of Germany. And Baker uh, has prepared notes. Uh, this comment, not one inch, is in his notes, and he says it uh, to Gorbachev too. He says, well, it's, they're hypothesizing. What about, would you accept unified Germany if we said NATO would not move one inch to the east? And then later he says, if NATO's jurisdiction would not move one inch to the east. And that's already a sort of, Baker's a lawyer, he's using this word jurisdiction that doesn't really apply. Um, what's interesting is that the, the, those minutes go back to Washington and almost that, or that night, the National Security Council staff responds to Baker and says, this is not our policy. And Baker immediately begins to walk it back as well. So, and I'm sorry to go on at length, but I think this is really, really important because Putin talks about it so much. First of all, Gorbachev did not agree to this deal in the meeting. He didn't, he didn't say, if you look at the minutes, yes, that's the deal. And he never pursued it in any way. He actually pushed back against it. But Baker walked it back immediately too. And there then proceeded to be all sorts of conversations with Gorbachev about Germany, about the unification of Germany. In a far more important meeting in Washington, Gorbachev tells Bush and Scowcroft that it is up to a sovereign Germany to choose its own alliance. Gorbachev says that and agrees to it. And it's so important that the Soviets in the room start making noises and they're gonna have a major argument on the White House lawn later on. They understand what Gorbachev has just given up here, that it's unified Germany will join NATO and that Gorbachev has just essentially greenlit that. So it's a, it's a really, it's a red herring, I'm sorry to say, um, and it's, it's sort of the, face that launched a thousand ships, but they're all headed in the wrong direction, I think. Uh, TP asks uh, remotely, both Russia and China have claimed the expansion of NATO threatens their national securities. Are their claims justified? Yeah, this is a really important question. I do not think that that's a valid complaint from the Chinese whatsoever, so I would just discount that immediately. <laughs> um, the Russians here, this is where I think it does get really interesting and we need to really, really think about this clearly. I, based on the history of NATO and despite these moments that, that uh, Matt brought up where NATO did act out of area, I see no evidence at all that NATO would act offensively in a military or strategic sense against Russia out of the blue. NATO does not exist to take the fight to to Russia. So I do not think that NATO poses a military threat to Russia in a sort of existential sense the way it's portrayed. I do think that NATO does help as a part of a broader political and economic threat to President Putin. I think that it helps protect a part of the world that demonstrates a different political economic future for people and that uh, it presents a very unflattering comparison to the life uh, for many Russians under Putin. So I do think it's part of this broader threat that Putin sees, but it's the threat of seeing that people can live in a, a, a different way than, than he allows in, in Russia. Okay. I also remotely, hopefully I pronounced this correctly, Agata Kovaleska has asked the following, um, not knowing anything about the politics of US military, is NATO a good reason to support the US military at such a size it, as it is, or would the US military be as big regardless of whether uh, NATO was a factor in that? This is, a, yeah, excellent question, really thoughtful. The United States spends an enormous amount of money on its military. I think there's lots of room for discussion about how that money is spent and where, but I think it is a mistake to believe that it would be cheaper to not have NATO. In fact, it would be far more expensive for the United States to have to face a world in which there were scrambles for security in Europe. So many allies benefit from US defense spending, there's no doubt about it, but the United States does benefit from being a part of this alliance um, that protects Western Europe on its behalf and with its partnership. Way more expensive to not have NATO. Uh, 
I have two questions. Um, you had mentioned briefly like the communique that occurred, um, kind of like this demeanor of um, public officials um, saying things about NATO. Um, so I was going to ask to what extent will the people and the political aspirations of certain individuals be the demise of NATO rather than, you know, a real threat um, to uh, like physical threat. And then my second question would be to what extent do you believe the expansion of NATO is actually also going to lead to its demise and its weakening its ability to meaningfully and efficiently act um, to threats? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a real puzzle with NATO history. How many of these sort of boilerplate community or communiques, these public agreed documents came out of NATO meetings every six months for the whole Cold War and beyond? And when you get into the records, you see that the people making policy did not think that the things they were saying in the communique were the best reasons for what they were doing. And it's not about misleading, it's about politics and democracies and how do you frame things um, in a way. But I, I do think they, are, they do have a negative effect on NATO. And, and my preference, if I could just you know, lay out a perfect world, would be for governments to really clearly explain to their people why they need a defense establishment and why they need to be part of an alliance. So that would be my preference. I'm probably dreaming in technicolor because I know how domestic politics work, but I just think the alliance would be stronger if we had more and open conversations about the fact that the world is a very dangerous place and that we need these institutions to defend them. If that, that's the logic that drives the alliance, then let's speak about it. Um, expansion of NATO, oh, we might get an answer to your question one way or the other fairly soon, and I was wrong on my prognostication as to whether Putin would invade Ukraine, so I might very well be wrong here too. Um, I think it can be managed. I, do th I think NATO expansion can be managed, but it's extremely hard work. And the, NATO survived the Cold War with extremely hard work by diplomats from all of the countries, by military officers acting as diplomats to keeping an alliance together is hard work and the, it, it can go wrong if people don't work to maintain it or if states try and use the alliance for their own, um, their own gains. So I do, I do think it can, it can work and it can be managed, but it's hard, hard work. There's a question over here. Oh, okay. If Russia is deemed to cross a red line in Ukraine or if they invade Moldova or something else, how does voting work within NATO as far as action? And does the European Union ever lobby efforts? Uh, really great questions. I can tell you that most of the NATO allies would have given you a different, they each would have given you a different answer to this question during the Cold War. So the smaller allies would have said, of course there will be a vote in the council where our voices will all be equal and things will only happen based on unanimity. And that London, Washington, Paris and Bonn did not think it worked that way and made a lot of agreements between themselves that they then brought to the council. So NATO prides itself on unanimity, works very hard um, in terms of unanimity. The United States has made clear that sometimes it might act even if one or two allies disagree. So there are a number of different ways of answering that, that question. I think that if there was a situation where there was a real split in the council, that the, uh, the NATO allies on one side would act as a coalition rather than as NATO, because to do otherwise, I think, would just break, it would just end the alliance. If, if the, so NATO has prided itself on unanimity for so long, but that, that could be its, a real Achilles heel. And I, I'm, not, I'm sure there are memos being right now focused on how unanimity works. Um, Article 5 is declared um, by the council, but the, what I've, was most shocking to me was just how much of NATO was made up as it went along. And I'm sorry, there was another part to the question. Yeah. Um, are, are there any mechanisms for the European Union to lobby NATO? Oh. They work yeah, they don't work interchangeably, but there are different um, caucuses within NATO. Um, I, I think some of the uh, people in this room actually know, would, there's some people who know more about this, but the, the, there's different constellations of states um, that, that work within NATO to have their voice heard as a group. And these have changed over time, but um, yeah, there, there are some formal and informal mechanisms um, for this, but I, 
I don't see the EU really making an appeal to NATO in particular. There's a lot of connections, but they're very, they can be very blurry. I was curious about the funding. Um, America does do a lot of the funding for NATO. And so I understand that a lot of the countries in NATO are now upping and have right. been upping their percentage. But I wonder why they don't, why they have to be kind of forced into that. You know, I mean, they're the place that has all these wars. <laughs> so why don't they realize how much they need to protect each other? The, it's an excellent question again. So I mean, the, the first point I would, I would just make out, there's sort of two different ways that you can think of how NATO is paid for. So NATO itself, which has this headquarters in Brussels and, and these different, NA, as an international organization, is paid for by all of the states and they each pay a different amount based on their, their size, et cetera. So the United States does pay a large proportion of that very small amount of money that runs the organization. The big spending is on national militaries. Okay, and the United States far outstrips its spending on, national, on its national military compared to the Europeans and the Canadians spend on their own national militaries that then collectively make up the alliance. Since NATO was founded, the United States has been urging the European allies to do more for their defense. It's, it has long been the story. But I think that's really revealing in a few ways. First of all, there's a sense, of course, some sense that the Europeans need to do less because the Americans do so much. Right? And, I, and I fully understand that view. But I also think it's revealing about American preferences. So American presidents understand this and they're, they try and get the Europeans to pay more. But at the end of the day, they, find, they just decide that it is, it is in the, the interest of the United States that the United States does what it does and that NATO continues to exist. And I do think that goes to that other question about sort of the value of NATO to the United States. I think the United States understands it would be much more expensive to pay for the, to, to manage its own defense without Western Europe. So it's a long story. If you go through history, we now talk about a 2% commitment to defense spending. Um, Jimmy Carter had made it 3% uh, before, and so th this is a long-standing problem. But it's, I don't think it's only revealing about Europeans. It is. It says a lot about the Europeans. Real question about whether this is a turning point in Europe. Um, but it also does say something about the value of NATO to the United States. I mean, as you point out, American officials know this, and yet they continue to go along with it. I think they see that, on balance, it's worth it. Ben Freeman asks, uh, how does the US military failures, failures in Iraq and Afghanistan affect Putin's calculations of NATO's resolve for future military action? I might add to that yeah. also, um, in your assessment, has Putin just made the case that, well, nuclear weapons make some of this other stuff irrelevant too, right? Right, right. Um, I think 2003 is important in the rhetorical space in that it's, it's difficult for the United States and its allies who invaded Iraq to, um, it provides some sort of propaganda for the Russians to say, well, remember 2003, you attacked a sovereign country as well. Uh, totally different circumstances, I want to be clear, but it still does give Putin um, a tool. Um, I don't think that, that it, it I, I don't read it as, a, as a, in a sense that he thinks the United States is, is weak. And, and that's only because I think he probably came to that, he came to the conclusion that NATO is weak for a whole bunch of other reasons. <laughs> I think there are another, enough other reasons for him to think that. I think he got it wrong, but he, I think he thought that because of um, not just the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but this larger conversation about America's place in the world and its role, and a larger question about whether the Europeans would actually do anything. And I think this goes, connects with the last question. There's a lot of evidence for the Europeans um, n not to rise uh, to the occasion. So I think there are other reasons besides Iraq. Um, and on the nuclear question, whether that provides space for these conflicts, is that the? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it's so frightening because we are seeing obviously nuclear posturing and signaling already and saw it fairly early in this crisis. Um, I, I, think, I think that on balance that I think that Putin would say that no nuclear weapons could very much be a part of this 
crisis rather than that they allow for space for it to operate. Um, I believe today it was announced that uh, President Biden is heading to Europe in the next couple of days to shore up relations with NATO nations. What is he doing? I mean, what has to be done right now? Is there a sense that the resolve of these NATO nations is ebbing somewhat over the conflict in Ukraine? Or what do you think is happening? Sure. I think that the, the president's trip will be part of uh, this broader effort for the United States to put enormous diplomatic and other energy into this crisis. So the Biden administration was, was faulted terribly by its European allies and, and by its European allies for the withdrawal, the hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan. That, that, was, a, 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 that was a real crisis in sort of U, U.S.-NATO relations. The United States had... Um, had really urged NATO to take up that role in Afghanistan and all of a sudden it was withdrawn. So I think what we're seeing now um, is a really striking effort by the United States to keep channels open with, um, with European diplomats, but a part of that is also keeping the, the European public engaged in this. And so it's a big deal for the president to be going there in the midst of a crisis. And he's continuing to signal his resolve for, uh, for the alliance and for Europeans. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily a, a reaction to any particular trend line in the war, but part of this bigger argument, and also countering this implicit Russian argument that the United States really doesn't have Europe's back. So I, I see it as part of this continuity of a really strong, really strong American effort, and, and I think, thank goodness, the Biden administration learned from Afghanistan. They learned a real lesson there, I think. I, uh... Richard Nolan, uh, one of our colleagues in political science, asked a follow-up question on the EU. Does NATO represent a de facto security apparatus for the EU? Uh, or alternatively, does NATO's continuation make it difficult for the EU to develop a comprehensive security arrangement for the EU itself as distinct from NATO? Uh, so yes, I mean, it's an excellent question. It's a, a, it's a complicated one. The European Union is a complicated uh, place. There's no doubt that the United States, especially in the 1990s, took efforts to ensure that NATO would be the security organization in Europe um, and, and really worked to counter some French efforts in the early 90s to see a, a real European security pillar emerging. So they, they ended up meeting, but they didn't quite meet in the middle. So the United States and, and as a result, NATO have posed a real challenge to European security, um, both because it's very difficult to explain to your people, your taxpayers, why you need two different structures for your defense. But, but more important, I think, it does go back to this, these arguments I was making about how US officials understand Europeans and European history. And I'm making a really broad point here. But there, is real, there has been, in all the documents I've seen, real worry as to whether Europe can defend itself and whether it's a good idea for Europe to defend itself because the track record has not been good in the long scheme of things. Um, and so you do see real concerns by Americans that the Europeans would um, choose a, an option that wasn't in the American interest if, if they weren't joined by security. So you know, it's a little of column A and a little bit of column B, but I do think that, the, that NATO, yeah, I, I do think it's been a real challenge for the EU to get its act together on security because of NATO. Yeah. Um, so you've said that NATO is a pure, I'm not sure you've said that, not, this or not, but uh, I believe that NATO is a purely defensive pact that does not pose any offensive risk or security threat to Russia. Um, do you know of any evidence or anything that proves that NATO will never be an offensive, offensive threat to Russia? Uh, no, I don't know of any evidence that NATO will not become uh, an offensive threat to Russia. Um, I, what, what I am arguing is that in all of the documents I have seen, um, it's just it, it, I've never seen uh, in, in NATO, at least in the last 70 years, any idea that NATO existed um, to to threaten Russia with military force to gain objectives, whether territorial or anything else. That, that there's, I have seen no evidence that NATO exists to pose uh, 
um, an offensive military threat to NATO. That's different than me saying that NATO's military plans rely on striking Russia in case the Russians strike NATO. That, of course, exists. But, um, of course, anything can develop in any way. I can't look into the future, but I don't see any reason. I can think of no reason why any of the of the major NATO allies or NATO would ever think that it was a good idea to begin an offensive war against Russia. I just don't, I can't conceive of it. I'm going to ask the last question, actually. Sure. Uh, and so uh, one of your uh, former co-authors, Hal Brands, published a piece uh, this week in Foreign Affairs. He co-authored it, and I, you may or may not have read it. I haven't actually read it. I but, will, Hal. Uh, I will. He, he argues in this piece that the first 10 years of the Cold War, and he includes the formation of NATO within this, really demonstrated creative uh, thinking on the part of US and other policymakers. And he's making the case that we need another effort, a uh, creative uh, intellectual effort, to kind of reimagine and not do away with. He's actually arguing in his piece for kind of a strengthening of, of not just NATO as a collective security arrangement, but other initiatives as well. So my question there would be, to what extent do you think this current crisis presents an opportunity for reimagining um, not just NATO as a, a, as a collective security arrangement, but also kind of the global order uh, in terms of, of international security? Sure, it's a, it's a really great question. I do think that this crisis, no matter how it ends, and that's a very perilous thing to say, will, will change calculations, but how major will those changes be? And unfortunately, I think there's a real correlation between just how destructive this war is and how much change there will be in the global order. And so the United Nations, NATO, the economic instruments that were built up after the Second World War were built up after the Second World War in the ashes of a destroyed Europe. It took the Second World War, took the First World War and the Second World War, right, for the United States to sign its first security alliance since the 18th century. And so while I think there will be change, I hope it won't be that dramatic because I think that you can only have these periods of such intense creativity and opportunity in, um, in the midst of just utter destruction. I uh, perhaps that's not the. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a real downer. I know. To, to, to I'm sorry. I'll I'll end with a, a personal anecdote. Okay. So in summer of 1992, I was an intern at the Czech Embassy. Actually, ah. so I'm dating myself there as well. Um, the two biggest issues of discussion in summer of 1992 in the Czech Embassy in Washington D.C. were first of all the separation of Czechoslovakia because that's the summer when that was taking place. The second was what the, were the implications on this for NATO and of NATO for a now separating Czechoslovakia, right? You know, that, those were the two things that the intern spent our summer researching uh, to try to help the, the, the Czechs and the Slovaks, in this case, as they're, right. they're separating, uh, try to help them understand. I'll also end with a, hopefully this doesn't seem impertinent, the Chargé d'Affaires in, in the, the Czech embassy at the time, every Wednesday they would have the interns in uh, to drink Czech beer, and I didn't then and I don't now uh, consume alcohol, but everybody else did, especially the Chargé d'Affaires, and he would tell us the same joke every Wednesday <laughs> at 2 p.m. for eight weeks. And the joke was, what do you call the Czech half when they separate? Because the, the Slovak side's app, obvious, Slovakia makes sense, but what do you call the Czech half? The answer is Czechno-Slovakia. <laughs> so, again, we heard that joke every Wednesday at two for eight weeks straight. It's a good uh, from the drunk Chargé uh, d'Affaires. <laughs> so we can end on, on that note. Thanks, Perhaps that's thanks for asking more, me to talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sorry. Uh, I don't know if that's more humorous or whatever. But thank you all for sure. joining us uh, in person and, and remotely. Uh, this will be posted uh, over the course of the next few days uh, so that you can watch, you can share it with friends if uh, they were unable to attend. Uh, it will be posted on the Bob Graham Center YouTube channel uh, later this week. Uh, so thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt.